Welcome back to section 3.2, where today we are talking about using matrices to solve systems of equations. So we have a note here to get us started that says a linear equation can have any number of variables. All right, so in our last section, 3.1, we were solving systems of equations in two unknowns. So we were looking at examples with just x and y but we could have a linear equation in three variables, usually we'd see x, y, and z, or even four variables, where here we could label them as x1, x2, x3, x4. The possibilities are indeed endless. All right, so let's talk about deconstructing a linear equation. So we can actually write this equation without using the variables. All right, so that's what we're going to try to do here. We can write this equation without using variables. Well, how do we do that? Let's take our equation. We have 2x minus y is equal to 3, and we're going to take all of the numbers out with, and we're going to leave the x and y behind. So the first number I see is 2 in front of this x. So we'll have 2. Is there a number in front of the y? Let's double check. We don't just skip over this. There's a minus 1 in front of the y. Maybe not as obvious as the 2, but we can't forget about this negative 1. I'll leave a little bit of space here so it doesn't look like we're taking 2 minus 1 here. And then the 3 on the other side of the equation we're also going to take with us. And we're going to put brackets around these three numbers. Right, these three numbers are the coefficients, and so we call this a coefficient row. All right, so this is how we can deconstruct a linear equation just by taking out the coefficients and writing them within this bracket to call it a coefficient row. All right, now when we look at systems of equations, this coefficient row will grow a little bit. All right, so instead we're going to call it a matrix. So here our definition says a matrix is a rectangular array of numbers. All right, technically what we have here, this 2, negative 1, and 3 counts as a matrix. There's a rectangular array of numbers. Only for a single equation, though. We can have bigger ones. All right, and then an augmented matrix of a system of linear equations includes the right-hand side of the equations. Again, in our example above, we included the right-hand side of our equal sign. So above is also an augmented matrix. All right, let's take a look at example two. We want to write the following systems of equations as an augmented matrix. All right, so let's look at our first one here. We're going to write this as our matrix. This time our bracket has to grow a little bit in order to have two rows involved. All right, the first coefficient, whatever number is in front of the x, that's just a positive one. Then whatever number is in front of y, here we have negative one again, so negative one, and then a zero on the other side of the equal sign. So that's our first row in our matrix. Our second row corresponds to the second equation. Here we have positive 1 in front of x, positive 1 in front of y, and a negative 6 on the right-hand side of the equation. They can get even larger. Let's take a look at b. This one has three rows, so our bracket needs to grow even larger. All right, the first coefficient is 5. That's in front of x here. So 5, 
Our next coefficient is this 0 0.5 in front of y, 0 0.5. And then we kind of have a blank space here. All right. If we look down at our next row, it looks like there should be a z involved. It looks like we should have three variables involved in this system of equations. The fact that we do not have a z in the top row means that the coefficient in front of z is zero. All right, and then on the right-hand side, we have 1.5. Go ahead and close our brackets now that we know how long our matrix is going to be here. And let's take a look at our second row. We have 4.2 as the coefficient for x, 2.1 as the coefficient for y, 2.1 as the coefficient for z, and then 0 on the other side of the equal sign. Finally, looking at our third row, again, we have a space here. This space represents the variable x. Since we don't have the variable x here, that means its coefficient must be 0. Our next coefficient here is this 0 0.2 in front of y. Our next coefficient is 2, that's in front of our z. And then we have a positive 1 on the left-hand side of the equation. However, as we saw in 3.1, we like to have all of our variables on one side of the equation and the rest of the numbers on the other side of the equal sign. So really, that positive 1 needs to be moved over to this side. But of course, the only way we can do that is if we subtract 1 from both sides. So that means negative 1 will be on the right-hand side of this equation. All right. So now we've seen how to write an augmented matrix if there's a missing variable. That means the coefficient is 0. And we do have to make sure we are looking at the right columns, x, y, z, and then our number column. We need to make sure everything goes in the proper column or our calculations won't work out at the end. All right, let's look at this last one here. Looks like we're going to have two rows in this matrix. Again, we're looking for x, y, and a number here. It only looks like two variables. So our first coefficient for x in our top row is 2. For y is negative 1. And then we have a positive 3 on the right-hand side. And here in our second row, we need to do a little bit more moving around again because here this negative 3y is, involves a variable Variables should all go on one side. So that means we need to add 3y to both sides. So we get positive 1x, positive 3y, and then 5 stays on the right-hand side. All right, so now that we know how to rewrite systems of equations as augmented matrices, the question is, why would we choose to do this? Sorry about that dog barking there. Hopefully we've got that taken care of for now. So we were just about to move on to discuss what we can do with these systems of equations now written in matrix form. All right, so we have what we call elementary row operations, and there are three possible row operations. All right. We'll mostly be using just operations one and two that are listed here for this semester. Okay. So the first option is replacing a row R by a non-zero multiple of itself. So when we say a non-zero multiple, we can also divide. We can say one half divide, there we go, we could say one half times a row, 
All right. For this example, if we have a row that's given to us as 3, 2, and 1, we can multiply that row by 2 to get 6, 4, and 2. All right. Or we could multiply it by 1 half to get 3 halves, 1 and 1 half. All right. So that is an, uh, an elementary row operation. Another row operation would be replacing a row with some combination of itself and another row. What do we mean by that? Well, let's take a look at this example. We have row 1, which is 3, 2, 1, and row 2, which is 4, 5, 6. What if we subtract row 1 minus row 2? How would we write this out? Row 1 is 3, 2, 1. Row 2 is 4, 5, and 6. If we subtract one row from the other, 3 minus 4 is negative 1, 2 minus 5 is negative 3, and 1 minus 6 is negative 5, there's our new row, negative 1, negative 3, and negative 5. That means row 1 is going to be replaced by this new row. Option number 3 is that we can switch the order of two rows. All right, so we can simply replace one row and move the other row into its original spot. All right, here our top row was numbers, our bottom row was letters. We can simply switch the rows. Like I said, for this course, we'll mostly be using row operations that are listed here as 1 and 2. All right, and then another note for us down below that row operations do not change the final solution. Any solution to the original system will also be a solution to this new or modified system. All right, in fact, we can undo our row operations. We can reverse them by applying what we call inverse row operations. All right, now why would we need these row operations? What do we use them for? Well, we can actually solve systems of equations by using row operations. In our last section, we looked at how to solve systems graphically and algebraically using elimination. And now we're looking at row operations to solve systems of equations. All right, so here, here we are presented with a system of equations. We have two equations in two unknowns, x and y. And the first thing we should do is go ahead and rewrite this system into a matrix. All right, so that's step one is to rewrite in matrix form. All right, so our new matrix looks like negative two-thirds, positive one-half, and negative three. And our bottom row looks like one-fourth, negative one, and eleven-fourths. Now I'm going to let us know what is our goal matrix because when we're performing these row operations, it's important to know what we are striving for. All right, so our goal matrix is going to look like some like some uh, diagonal here of ones, zeros on the opposite diagonal and then some numbers in the third column here. So what we're going to do is attempt to make our current matrix look like this goal matrix. And this will be the same goal matrix for all systems of the same size. And the goal matrix keeps the same form but does grow as your system grows. We'll see larger matrices here in a little bit. 
So before we start applying our row operations in order to get our current matrix to look like our goal matrix, an optional second step would be to simplify. All right, so when we say simplify, we mean things like maybe let's get rid of all of the fractions or maybe let's get rid of any decimals that we might have. All right, we're going to be doing a lot of small arithmetic here. So the easier numbers are going to be the whole numbers. So let's make this as easy on ourselves as possible. So how can we do that? Well, let's look at this top row for a moment. Negative two thirds, positive one half, negative three. What could we say multiply this row by that would cancel out a three in the denominator and a two in the denominator? How about six? So our first simplification step will be applying our first row operation, replacing a row by a non-zero multiple of itself. We write that as six times row one with this arrow. That's letting us know what operation we are applying. So we take six times negative two thirds, that gives us negative four. Six times positive one half gives us three. And six times negative three gives us negative 18. Now you're welcome to do this work on the side. If it is more helpful for you to stay organized, you can pull your scratch work out on the side all right, we will, we will do that when it comes to a little bit larger of a step here in a moment. But so we've multiplied one entire row by six. Now multiplying our bottom row by six is not going to help. It's not going to cancel out those fours in the denominator. So we can go ahead and choose to multiply the bottom row by four instead. So here we have four times row two, four times one fourth gives us one, four times negative one gives us negative four, and four times 11 over four gives us 11. All right, so we've now applied one operation to both the top row and the bottom row. And we have made note of what operations we have performed. Okay, so now that we've written it in matrix form, we've done a simplification step, now we start trying to get our matrix to look like our goal matrix. All right, so step three, still in the way a little bit, there we go. Step three, start by finding the zeros from left to right. So that means the first step that we're going to make is to try to get this zero here in the bottom left hand corner. All right, so we are targeting this one here in the bottom left hand corner and we want that one to become zero. Okay, we have to remember our possible operations. Let's go back up to look at our three possible operations. We can replace a row by a non-zero multiple of itself, so we can multiply through by positive or negative numbers, just can't be zero. Okay, we can replace a row with some combination of itself and another row so we can add or subtract two rows from each other. Or we could switch the order of two rows. But none of these options include just adding or subtracting a constant number. So the easiest way we could look at and say, well, let's just subtract one from the bottom row. That will give us zero. And while you are correct that that would give us zero, unfortunately that is not a valid row operation. 
So instead, we can't multiply through by zero, so that rules out option number one. Switching rows isn't going to help, that rules out option number three. So the only thing we're left with is option number two, somehow combining these two rows to get zero. We did this back in chapter 3.1 when we had a system of equations and we said, hey, we are trying to solve by elimination, we would like to eliminate one of the variables. Here we are trying to eliminate this variable. All right, so we have a positive one, somehow has to combine with a negative four. So what can we do? Well, we could multiply the bottom row by a negative four or by a positive four, and then negative four plus positive four, well, that would give us the zero that we're looking for. All right, so I'm going to leave the top row alone. I'm going to leave negative four, positive three, and negative 18. Now I'll make a comment that certainly we could have divided the top row by four if we wanted to just get negative one and positive one to cancel out. But in general, it's always a decent idea to attempt to stay away from fractions. It's not always possible, but it would make this calculation a little bit more simple. All right, so the top row stays the same. This bottom row, well, I'm going to multiply it by four, so four times the second row Right, we said that's going to give us a positive four, and if we add that together with the first row, row one, that will give us the zero that we are looking for. All right, now we're kind of doing two steps in one here. You are more than welcome to do one step at a time, or you could also jump outside for a moment to do some scratch work, so let's do that. Let's do some scratch work. All right, let's start by doing four times row two. So four times row two, that should give us positive four, negative 16, and positive 44. And then we said we were going to add row one which is negative four, positive three, and negative 18. If we add these two rows together, we get positive four plus a negative four, that's zero. Negative 16 plus three, well that's negative 13. And 44 plus a negative 18, that gives us positive 26, and this is our new bottom row. Zero, negative 13, and positive 26. So for this step, our goal was to get a zero in the bottom left corner, and we have now done just that. All right, so we're still in step three. We're trying to find the zeros from the left to the right. So that means our next goal is going to be this positive three here. We need that positive three to be a zero. Okay, so we need to think about what row operations are possible for us to combine in order to get this three to be zero. So again, reordering these rows is not going to be helpful here. All right, unless that negative 13 was already a zero, that wouldn't be helpful for us. Okay, so option three is out. Option one was multiplying by a non-zero number. Since we can't multiply by zero, then we can't get three to be zero that way. So our only option left is option two, somehow combining our top and bottom rows. Well, our bottom row has some pretty large numbers. We're looking at negative 13 and positive 26 there. So 
it's always a good idea when possible to simplify before you try doing another step. All right, that's going to make our calculations just that much easier for us. All right, I'm going to start a new line down here on the left. Okay, so I'm going to simplify again, this time by dividing the bottom row by 13. So 13, or 1 over 13 times row 2. This is an optional simplification step. You do not have to do this, all right, but I'm going to leave the top row alone, negative 4, positive 3, and negative 18. 0 divided by 13 is 0. Negative 13 divided by positive 13 leaves us with a negative 1. And then 26 divided by 13 leaves us with a positive 2. So remember, our goal for this next step is to make this 3 become a 0. And now we're looking at combining 3 with negative 1. Now, hopefully, it's a bit easier to see what our next step should be. All right, so our next step here, we're trying to get a 0 where that positive 3 is. Okay, so I see that if we multiply the bottom row by 3, we would get a negative 3 in that column. Negative 3 plus positive 3, well, that would give us the 0 that we are looking for. So let's make a note of what we're about to do. We're going to multiply the bottom row, so that's row 2, by 3, and then we're going to add the top row, row 1, and we are replacing the top row. So you always get a choice of which row you're choosing to replace with your new combination of rows. And again, you're welcome to jump out here and do your scratch work if you'd like. But let's see if we can work through this one step at a time. So 3 times row 2. So 3 times 0 plus negative 4. Well, that gives us negative 4. 3 times negative 1 plus positive 3 gives us that 0 that we're going for. And then 3 times positive 2, that gives us 6. Minus 18, that gives us negative 12. There's our new top row. And we're going to choose to leave the bottom row alone for now. So 0, negative 1, and positive 2. Let's zoom out again so we see our goal matrix. And we're pretty close. We have the zeros now where we want them. So we're done with step 3. Now we need to get the 1s. All right, so the 1s need to be on this diagonal. Need to be 1. Technically, a positive 1. So the bottom row, we're almost there. We have a negative 1. So all we need to do is multiply through by a negative 1 to get that to switch over. And the top row, we have negative 4. And we need that to become positive 1. So we can go ahead and multiply the top row by a negative 1 fourth. I know we said we'd like to stay away from fractions if possible, but especially on this last step, usually it's necessary to get that 1 that we're looking for. So negative 1 fourth times row 1, and we can go ahead and multiply the bottom row by that negative 1 that we mentioned already. And this is technically step 4, find the 1's on what we call the main diagonal. All right, so we multiply the top row by negative 1 fourth. Negative 1 fourth times negative 4 gives us positive 1. Negative 1 fourth times 0, well, that's just 0. And negative 1 fourth times a negative 12 gives us a positive 3. And what do we get for our bottom row? Well, negative 1 times 0 is 0. Negative 1 times negative 1, that's the positive 1 that we were looking for. 
and negative 1 times 2 gives us negative 2. So now our matrix matches the goal matrix. This matches the goal matrix. All right, now even though we found a matrix that matches our goal matrix, you might be wondering why did we just go through all of that work? We were asked to solve a system of equations. How is this new matrix somehow the answer to our system of equations? All right, well just in the way that we took equations and we wrote them into a matrix form, we can take a matrix and write it back into an equation form. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so let's remember that we have an X, a Y, and a number column here, and that our matrix contains all of the coefficients. So step five would be rewrite back into equations. So here we have one X, plus 0y is equal to 3, and 0x plus 1y is equal to negative 2, which can be simplified as x equals 3 and y is equal to negative 2, and that is our solution for this problem which we could write it as a point as well when x is 3, y is negative 2, we could write it out like this. And now we have solved our system of equations. Now you might be wondering again, why do all of this work when elimination in 3.1 seemed to work much more quickly? And that is a fantastic question. All right, so row reduction, that's what we call using our row operations. All right, so row reduction is kind of bulky for a system with only two unknowns, X and Y, like we see here. But it's actually extremely efficient when we get into significantly larger matrices. All right, we're going to see some of those in a little bit as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at some more examples of solving systems of equations. Specifically, it's called Gauss-Jordan reduction or row reduction, and we are going to work together to solve these few matrices here. All right, so let's go ahead. Our first step was rewrite our system of equations in matrix form. Okay, so here we have one, make it a little bigger, there we go, one, negative one and zero, positive one, positive one, and negative six. Usually it's helpful to remind ourselves what our goal matrix is going to be for a matrix of this size. Again, we want ones on the main diagonal, zeros on the opposite, and numbers in this last column here. This is our goal matrix. All right. We're going to start by simplifying if necessary. I don't see any fractions or decimals here, so we're good to go. And we're going to start by finding the zeros first, again, in order from left to right. So let's go ahead and do just that. So let's identify our first target. This one in the bottom left hand corner, we need that to become a zero. Again, we cannot multiply through by zero and we cannot just go subtracting one, even though that would be quite simple, wouldn't it? Instead, we have to come up with some kind of combination of each row in order for this to work out. Well, our top row already has a positive one, so all we need to do is subtract the rows. Okay, so here let's write that we're going to do row one minus row two. 
Now you can subtract these in any order that you'd like, but just make sure you're doing the same order for each column. Alright, so we're going to leave the top row alone because we're targeting that bottom left hand corner. So the top row stays as it is. And now we have 1 minus 1. That gives us 0. That's what we were going for. Okay. And then we have row 1 minus row 2. So that means negative 1 minus positive 1. Again, make sure we got that order correct. That gives us negative 2. And then row 1 minus row 2, we have 0 minus a negative 6. That gives us a positive 6. Okay, so now that we have our first 0, we switch our target to find our next 0. Alright, so again we need to somehow combine this negative 1 and this negative 2 to get 0. Well, we could take row 2, row 2, and subtract 2 times the top row. Or place that in the top row position, and that will get us what we're looking for. Now, there are several different ways that you can come to the correct answer when using gauss jordan reduction. So if something else jumped out to you instead of this specific step, you're welcome to pursue that. All right. But let's look at row 2 minus 2 times row 1. Again, you could do this in two different steps. Or you could write your scratch work on the outside. All right. So here, let's see. Row 2, that's currently a 0 minus 2 times row 1, minus 2 times 1 is negative 2, so 0 minus 2, that's going to give us negative 2, negative 2 in row 2, minus negative 2 times negative 1, that's going to give us negative 2 plus 2, which gives us the 0 that we're looking for. Row 2 is 6 minus 2 times 0, so that 6 minus 0 gives us positive 6. We'll stay, we'll keep the bottom row as it is, 0, negative 2, positive 6. And now that we have both zeros where we want them, we start by finding our 1's on the main diagonal. And here, the simplest way to accomplish that is to multiply the top row by negative one-half and negative one-half by the bottom row as well. So here we'll end up with negative one-half times negative two gives us one. Anything times zero is zero. And negative one-half times six gives us a negative three. And we end up with the same on the bottom. Here we have negative one half times zero is zero. Negative one half times negative two is positive one. And negative one half times six is negative three. So now that our matrix looks like the goal matrix, we should rewrite as a system of equations again. Alright, so again, here we have 1x plus 0y is equal to negative 3, and 0x plus 1y is equal to negative 3. When you start feeling more comfortable with this, you can certainly jump to the next x equals negative 3, and y is equal to negative 3 without writing this in between step here. And so our final answer is negative 3 and negative 3. So let's go ahead and take a look at a little bit larger of a system here. 
Alright, so we have a system of three equations and three variables. So it's going to be a little bit larger. Okay, our goal matrix is going to change just a little bit. Let's go ahead and throw this system into a matrix. So here we have our X, Y, Z, and number columns here. X, Y, Z, and number column. Alright, we have 1, 3, and 1, negative 1, 3, and 3, 5, negative 1, and 2, negative 6, 10, and 5. So here is our matrix. Okay. And we can go ahead and write down our new goal matrix. Alright, so our goal matrix. We've seen goal matrices for a system of two equations in two unknowns, but our goal matrix here is a little bit larger. Alright, we have ones down the main diagonal, zeros everywhere else, and then our number column. Alright, and if we want to be even more specific, we can use our calculator to find the actual goal matrix. Alright, so what we're going to do is go ahead and jump on over to our virtual calculator to see what we can do with this matrix over there. Alright, so I'll zoom out, jump into our calculator. Here I'm running the TI-84+, plus, but any graphing calculator should have these matrix capabilities might just not be in the exact same location. Alright, but let's take a look. Here I'm going to go ahead and press the blue second button and then come down in the same column where I see the blue word matrix. I'm going to go ahead and click that button and it will open up a list of matrices that we can store into the calculator. I'm going to cursor over to the right and to the right again to get to that edit tab. It's already highlighting A. Let's go ahead and enter that button there. All right, and now we need to make the matrix be the correct size. All right, so we're going to say that we need three rows in our matrix since there are three equations. So we need three rows, we can hit enter, and we need four columns, one for each of the variables x, y, and z, and then one for the number column. So we need four columns. So now our matrix is the proper size. Let's see if we can scroll over. Nope, we won't be able to see that fourth column until we move ourselves over there. That's all right. Okay, and let's go ahead and enter in our matrix. And we're going to go through the rows one at a time here. So the first row is 1, negative 1, 5, and negative 6. And always be careful when you're typing negative numbers into your calculator. If you use the subtraction key instead of the negative key, the calculator will not fully understand what you're trying to tell it. All right, so make sure we're using this negative key, which is located down at the bottom row next to the Enter button. So we have our first row in. Let's add our second row in. Here we have three. 3, negative 1, and 10. And then our third row is positive 1, positive 3, 2, and 5. All right, now we have our entire matrix. We can go ahead and exit out of this. So second, quit. All right. So now what we want to ask it to do is actually do all of the row reduction work for us. That way we know ahead of time what our final answer should look like. It helps give us a better idea of where we're headed. 
So let's go ahead and click matrix again. So second matrix. And we need to move ourselves over to math here. And we're going to scroll down all the way until we see RREF. This stands for Reduced Row Echelon Form. Okay, we do want the double R's here, not just the single R, that's also an option. Okay, we're going to go ahead and click Enter. And then we need to put a matrix inside of this operation, so we have to click Second Matrix again. It's already highlighting our proper matrix A, so let's go ahead and Enter. And then it's good practice to close our parentheses there. Click Enter again, and here is our fully reduced matrix. So this is our goal matrix. All right, This is our solution matrix that we are going to attempt to find by hand. All right, now you might be asked to find this by hand on an upcoming test or quiz, and so we do need to know how to perform the row reduction on our own. However, the calculator is a very useful tool, especially to double check our answers or help us know where we're headed. All right, so now we have our accurate goal matrix. Let's go ahead back to our notes. And now we can specify that our goal matrix should be positive 1, 2, and negative 1. All right. So now that we know where we're headed, let's go ahead and do our row reduction steps. All right. Again, focusing with getting those zeros first from the left to the right. So that means our first goal is to make these two corresponding locations zero. Now it doesn't really matter which one you do first. What I noticed to, uh, immediately is that we have a one and a one. So I'm going to go ahead and eliminate that bottom one first and I'll come back and do that three in my next step. All right. So I want to eliminate that bottom one by somehow combining either the top or bottom row, since I notice the top row has a 1 in it as well. I know that I can just take row 3 and subtract row 1, and that will get me the 0 I am looking for. I'm going to leave the top and middle rows alone, so we can go ahead and write those in first if we want to. 3, 3, negative 1, and 10. And then here we have 1 minus 1 gives us the 0 we were hoping for. 3 minus a negative 1 gives us 4. And I'm so sorry about the dog in the background. Give me one moment. All right, so 2 minus 5 gives us a negative 3. And 5 minus a negative 6, well, that gives us positive 11. All right, so we got uh, the first 0 we were looking for. Let's focus our attention now on this 3. We need to somehow combine either the first or third rows with this middle row here. To cancel out this 3, 0 isn't too helpful for us, but we have that 1, and 1's are always nice and helpful. What we can do is multiply that top row by 3, or even negative 3 if we want to. So we could say we're going to take row 2 and subtract 3 times row 1. Now this is almost or this is two steps in one here. Please feel free to do these two steps one at a time if you'd rather. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and continue doing this in one step. 
and I'm planning to leave the top and bottom rows alone so I can go ahead and write those in here. I'm not changing those rows. So we need row 2 minus 3 times row 1. So that gives us 3 minus 3 times 1. So 3 minus 3 gives us the 0 we were looking for. 3 plus 3 gives us 6. Negative 1 minus 15 gives us negative 16. And 10 plus 18 gives us positive 28. So now that we've accomplished our first two zeros, our next goal would be to move on and look at our second two zeros. But before we can do that, let's take a quick look at each of our rows to see if there's any kind of simplification we might want to do. Remember, simplification is an optional step, but it might be beneficial, especially when we're doing these calculations by hand, to keep the numbers as small as possible. All right, so I'm looking at the middle row here, and I see 0, positive 6, negative 16, and positive 28. And I'm thinking all of those are even numbers. If it's an even number, it's divisible by 2. So let's go ahead and do an optional simplification step. Let's divide the middle row by 2. All right, I know we said generally we like to try to avoid fractions, but dividing through the middle row by 2 will not end up with any fractions, so we're good there. So let's go ahead and come down to our left and mention that we're going to divide the middle row by 2. So we're going to leave the top row alone. We're going to leave the bottom row alone. And now we're dividing that middle row by 2. So 0 divided by 2 is 0. 6 divided by 2 is 3. Negative 16 divided by 2 is negative 8. And 28 divided by 2 is positive 14. All right, so we just went ahead and simplified that middle row. Notice how we didn't end up with any fractions since each number present was even. All right, it just simplified the numbers down a little bit for us to help us with that arithmetic. All right, so again, let's change our focus. We already accomplished the first two zeros that we were looking for, so now we're looking for the two zeros in the second column. All right, so that would be this negative one here and this positive four. My mouse is going crazy. There we go, this positive four. How can we combine any one of these rows with any one of the other rows in order to get these to be zero? All right, so when we have a one, it's always pretty helpful for us because we don't need to find any common denominators or common factors. All right, so we can go ahead and just multiply the top row by four, and that will give us a negative four that'll cancel out with the positive four. So here, let's multiply the top row by 4 times row 1. And if we add that to row 3, that'll give us a 0 there. Okay. And we're going to choose to replace the top row. You could also choose to replace the bottom row here if you would like. All right. The only thing I would caution you about is because we do want to keep this 0 here. All right. As you'll see, during this next step, when we take 4 times the top row, that's 4 times 1 is 4, plus row 3, plus 0, that gives us 4. If we were replacing this row into the bottom row, we would get rid of that 0 that we worked so hard to find. Okay, so that's why we're choosing to do this step specifically to the top row instead of the bottom row. All right, so let's keep going. 4 times negative 1 plus 4, well, that's the 0 we were hoping for. 
4 times 5 is 20, plus negative 3, that's 17. And 4 times negative 6 is negative 24, plus 11, well that gives us negative 13. Alright, there's our new top row. We could go ahead and keep the middle row and bottom row as they are. Okay, so we have one of the two zeros in the second column. Let's focus on getting this next zero here. Alright, now this one is not as simple. We don't have a one to combine it with. We can't use the top row because we can't come up with any way to combine 0 and 4 that would give us 0 other than multiplication and remember that our legal row operations do not include multiplying by 0 that's an illegal operation all right so the first row is out we have to use the second row somehow so we have to come up with a way to combine 3 and 4 to get 0 and this is where we have to do a few extra steps here. You can do them all together in one step or you can do them in multiple steps. Okay, but if you can't find a common factor between them, well we can multiply the top row by 4 and the bottom row by 3 and then we'd end up with 12 in both of those places. Alright, we can make it go one step further by choosing one of those values to be negative. That way we can add those two rows and cancel them out. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to multiply this middle row by a negative 4 and the bottom row by a negative 3. Now, or by a positive 3 rather. And you could do this in two different steps if you'd like but our top row is going to stay the same. Our middle row is going to become 0, negative 12, 32, and negative 56. And our bottom row is going to become 0, 12, negative 9, and 33. Okay. So we're almost there. Again, we're trying to get this number to be 0, and now we have a positive 12 and a negative 12, so we can go ahead and add row 2 to row 3. So row 2 plus row 3. We're going to replace row 3. So row 1 stays the same. That's 4, 0, 17, negative 13. Row 2 will stay the same, 0, negative 12, 32, and negative 56. And our bottom row now we have 0, 0, 23, and negative 23. Alright, so we've now accomplished finding the two zeros in the second column. Before we switch our attention to the two zeros in the third column, I will again ask you to double check if we should do any simplification. Again, not a requirement, but never a bad idea to simplify. All right, that middle row we multiplied by negative four two steps ago, so we could go ahead and divide by a four if we wanted to. Alright, so let's divide by 4 in row 2. And in row 3, we have 0, 0, 23, and negative 23. So we could go ahead and divide through by 23. Alright, so our top row stays the same. Our middle row becomes 0 negative 3, 8, and negative 14. And our bottom row becomes 0, 0, 1, and negative 1. Alright, so now we turn our attention to the third column. 
where the two numbers we're looking at are 17 and 8. We would like to make these numbers go to 0 again by some combination of rows. And we do have a 1 down here in the third row, so we can use that 1 to our advantage. Okay, so let's go ahead and see. If we multiply that bottom row by negative 17, it will cancel out with the positive 17 in the top row. So we could write that as negative 17 times row 3. If we add that to row 1, we'll get the 0 that we're looking for. And we could go ahead and do another step if we'd like. We can say, well, what if we multiply the bottom row by negative 8? Negative 8 times the bottom row. If we add that to the middle row, that gives us the 0 that we're looking for in the middle row. We choose to leave the bottom row the same. There's nothing that we want to change about the bottom row specifically. Okay, so let's just make a quick note here that all of these extra multiplications that we're doing are happening on the outside of our matrix. They're happening in our scratch work. Okay, so we don't always have to change the bottom row. Here we say we're multiplying by negative 17 to row 3, but that's happening outside of our matrix. Okay, so negative 17 times 0, that doesn't change anything, well plus 4, so we have 4 in our top row. Negative 17 times 0 plus 0 again is 0. Negative 17 times, z times 1 plus 17, well, that gives us the 0 we were looking for. And negative 17 times negative 1 minus 13 gives us a positive 4. Our middle row here will end up with 0, negative 3, 0, and negative 6. And our bottom row stays at 0, 0, 1, and negative 1. Alright, we are almost done. We now have all of the zeros that we've been looking for. Our last step, or multiple steps, would be to get those ones down the main diagonal. Alright, remember our main diagonal is the diagonal that starts in the top left hand corner. We already have one in the bottom row. So we just need to focus on the top and middle rows. And here's where the simplest way and really the only way is to just go ahead and divide through by four for the top row and by negative three for the middle row. And that'll give us the ones that we're looking for. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to divide the top row by 1 fourth. And we're going to divide the bottom row by negative 3. Not the bottom row, the middle row. There we go. So the top row becomes 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 2 and 0, 0, 1, and negative 1. Alright, so let's double check that this matrix looks like the goal matrix that we wrote up above in blue. And look at that, the number column matches up 1, 2, and negative 1. So we just found the same answer that our calculator gave us. Alright, now again, we're not yet done, we need to finish up by rewriting our answer. So we found the correct matrix, but why do we care or how does this matrix give us the actual answer? Remember we have an X, Y, Z, and number column in a matrix of this size. And we could translate this back to equations, but what this would give us are the X, Y, and Z values. And we should write our answer in the form of a point. x, y, z is equal.
equal to, well, x is equal to 1. All right, so x is 1. y is equal to 2. y is 2. And finally, z is equal to negative 1. Here is our final answer. All right, so we already mentioned this previously, but again, you might be thinking, this is quite a lot of effort. All right, and yes, you are correct. If you notice how our calculator gave us the answer in just a fraction of a second, all right, then certainly doing this by hand can seem quite tedious. All right, but this is what the calculator is doing behind the scenes. All right, someone has to program the calculators and someone has to troubleshoot the calculators. All right, so it is important to understand what is going on behind the scenes in our technological products that we have today. Now, just like in solving systems of equations, we ended up with some odd or special outcomes. So let's go ahead and take a look at what those special cases could look like when solving systems using row reduction. All right, so let's go ahead and solve these systems together. Let's throw it into a matrix form. Here we have 2, 3, and 2, and negative 1, negative 3 halves, and negative 1 half. Never a bad idea to write down our goal matrix. Always helpful to know where we are headed. Here we only have two variables, x and y, so we're back to the original goal matrix that we were used to seeing. All right, again, we could throw this in our calculator if we wanted to and get the correct goal matrix with the correct values in our number column. All right, but we only have a few steps for this one, so let's go ahead and see if we can do this together. I'm going to speed up a little bit. Feel free to pause this video if you would like to double check each step on your own, and I would recommend that you do that as well. It's always good practice. All right, so I'm going to start by multiplying this bottom row by 2. Our top row stays the same. Our bottom row becomes negative 2, negative 3, and negative 1. All right, that was helpful just to cancel out the fractions, but now we take a look and see that this negative 2 cancels out with the positive 2 if we just add row 1 plus row 2. We'll leave the top row as 2, 3, and 2. Our bottom row becomes 0, and now 0, and positive 1. All right, before we go any further, okay, so we aren't done getting to this goal matrix, but before we get any further, let's take a quick moment and look at our columns. Remember, this is our x, y, and z column. If we translated this back into equations at the current moment, we'd have 2x plus 3y is equal to 2. But our bottom equation would look like 0x plus 0y is equal to 1. Well, that's telling us that 0 is equal to 1. And we saw in our last section, that's not possible. 0 is 0, so if we end up with something that's not possible or a false statement such as 0 equals 1, what we have is an inconsistent system. And inconsistent systems have no solution. All right, so we can go ahead and stop our row reduction there. There's no reason to continue because we will not find a solution. All right, let's go ahead and look at example B. We have a larger system again, three variables here. Let's see what happens with this one. 
Alright, so let's put it into a matrix form. Our top row is all ones. Our middle row is one fourth, negative one half, three fourths, and zero. And our bottom row is one, seven, negative three, and positive three. Okay. Now this is a little bit larger of, of a system, okay? In the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and plug it back into our calculator and see what happens. All right, so let's go back to the calculator. Let's go back to matrix. Go over to edit, enter. And we have the same size matrix here as we had previously. Let's change our entries now. Our top row is all ones. One, 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 and one. Our middle row is one fourth, negative one half, three fourths, and zero, and our bottom row is one, seven, negative three, and positive three. All right, so we'll go ahead and exit out of here by second quit. Let's do our reduced row echelon form. We get that by going back to matrix. So second matrix, scroll over to math, go all the way down, until we get to the RREF, that's our reduced row echelon form, hit enter. Back to matrix again, second matrix, hit enter for matrix A, close our parentheses, enter. All right, and now we have some really long decimals. So let's go ahead and see if we can actually have the calculator give it to us in fraction form. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the math button on the calculator. And the first option here says frac, as in fraction. I'm going to click enter, and enter one more time, and there is our previous matrix, but now with fractions instead of those long or repeating decimals. Okay, so what we'll notice for this matrix is that we have an entire row of zeros. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is an observation to make. So let's go ahead and write this matrix down in our notes and analyze what's going on with this system of equations. So we'll go back to our notes. We'll mention that we used a calculator. And this is what we ended up with. One, zero, five thirds, and two thirds, zero, one, negative two thirds, and positive one third, and then a row of entirely zeros. Okay, now if we went and translated this back into equations, this bottom row here would give us the equivalent of zero is equal to zero. Okay, so in our last example, we had zero was equal to one. That was an issue because zero is certainly not equal to one. Here we have zero is equal to zero. Okay, not necessarily an issue, but what it's telling us is that we are dealing with a redundant system a redundant system. We already know that zero is equal to zero. We didn't need to do all of that math to figure that out. Okay, and we saw redundant systems back in 3.1 as well. So redundant systems have infinitely many solutions. Alright, so what you would do is take these top two rows here, translate them back into equations, and then you would have to parameterize your solution. Alright, 
So let's go ahead and do that just real quick to make sure we're all on the same page here. This top row gives us x plus 5 thirds z is equal to 2 thirds. And this middle row gives us y minus 2 thirds z is equal to 1 third. We'll notice that both of these equations have a component that involves the variable z. So we'll write it one more time over here. This gives us x is equal to negative 5 thirds z plus 2 thirds and y is equal to positive 2 thirds z plus 1 third and this is our solution parameterized. By z. That means there's only z's left in our solution here. And technically for completeness, our point would be x, y, and z, where x is everything written up here. So x is negative 5 thirds z plus 2 thirds, y is positive 2 thirds z plus 1 third, and z is z. This is also parameterized by z. Alright, so let's keep going. We have a little note up next. Alright, a note that sometimes the number of unknowns or variables in the problem does not match the number of equations. There's two different possibilities for this. So when the number of equations is more than the number of unknowns, that's when we have an overdetermined system. And where the number of equations is less than the number of unknowns, we have an underdetermined system. Neither of these mean we cannot solve an equation, all right, or solve the system but they are something to keep in mind as they just might look a little bit funny to us after we've started to get used to row reduction and how matrices work. So let's take a note about what we're looking at here. Here we have x plus y is equal to 1, 13x minus 26y is equal to negative 11, and 26x minus 13y is equal to 2. So let's make a note of what we have here. We have two variables. We're dealing with x and y. But we have three different equations. All right, so we have the number of equations being more than the number of unknowns. We have an overdetermined system. That doesn't say we shouldn't try to solve the system, so let's go ahead, throw it into a matrix, and try to do some row reduction. All right, so our matrix looks like 1, 1, 1, 13, negative 26, and negative 11, then 26, negative 13, and 2. All right. Now, for your own practice, I recommend pausing this video and making sure you can complete this row reduction by hand. All right. So we would start with the first column, try to find the number of zeros, and go from there. What you're going to end up with and what you'll get when you plug it into a calculator all right, so I'll just make a note that what we get from a calculator is 1, 0, and 5 thirteenths, 0, 1, and 8 thirteenths, and a row of all zeros. All right, now we just saw an example with a row of all zeros, and we said 0 is equal to 0, okay but we went forward with it to find our parameterized general solution by finding our top and middle equations. 
Okay, so let's keep going. Do we have to end up with a parameterized system or not? If we look at the top row, this is our x, y, and number column. Our top row tells us that x is equal to 5 thirteenths, and our middle row tells us that y is equal to 8 thirteenths. So even though we end up with a row of entirely zeros, when we're looking at an overdetermined system, we still get an exact solution at the end. Only one solution. All right, and that solution should be written as a point x, y is equal to 5 thirteenths and 8 thirteenths. This is our solution. All right, again, I would see if you can do this row reduction by hand for good practice. All right, but in the interest of time, we'll leave it as is. The last thing we need to discuss today is this RREF that I've been mentioning is in the calculator. All right, it stands for reduced row echelon form. And we have a reduced row echelon form if a matrix meets the following three properties. So the leading entry of each row is a one. All right, so first of all, let's define leading entry. A leading entry, entry, there we go. Well, that's when we're reading from the left to the right, it's the first number in a row reading from left to right. All right, that's what a leading entry is. They must be one. Criteria number two, all other entries in the columns of the leading entries are zero. So when looking at all of our goal matrices so far, we had ones down the main diagonal. Those were the initial numbers in those rows. Those were the leading entries. And everywhere else there were zeros except for the final numbers column. The third criteria here says the leading entry in each row is to the right of the leading entry in the row above. And then finally, any rows of all zeros are at the bottom. All right, so there's three criteria that must be met in order for a matrix to be in reduced row echelon form. Our last example for this section is going to walk us through how we can determine if a matrix meets those criteria or not. All right, so let's take a look at example A. The first thing we need to determine, the leading entry of each row is one. So start from reading left to right. When you hit a number for the first time, that's the leading entry. That's a one. Read from left to right, that's a one. Read from left to right. All right, we have ones down the main diagonal. The first number on every single row is indeed one. So we meet the first criteria. The second criteria would be there are zeros everywhere else around the one. So all other entries in the columns of the leading entries are zero. So now we're reading up and down. We're looking at the columns. In our first column, are all of the other entries zero? They sure are. In the second column, are all of the other entries besides that leading entry, are they zero? Yes, they are. And in the third row, every other entry other than the leading entry must be zero, and it is. So we meet criteria one and two. The third criteria says that the leading entry in each row is to the right of the leading entry in the row above. So the best way to imagine this is that we have some kind of staircase action here. So our first leading entry, our second leading entry, and our third leading entry are always down and to the right of each other. Technically, also, this third criteria says any row of all zeros has to be at the bottom. 
And we do not have a row of all zeros here, so we do not need to worry about that part of the criteria. That being said, this first matrix here is row reduced. Let's take a look at matrix B. So let's again read through our three criteria. Number one, the leading entry of each row is a one. So we read from left to right, the first number we hit is our leading entry, that's a one. Reading from left to right, first number we hit, that's a one. All right, we meet criteria number one. Criteria number two, all other entries in the columns of the leading entries are zero. Let's look at the columns. In our first column, we do not have any leading entries, so we can disregard that first column. In our second column, we have a leading entry, and the other entry is zero. And in the third column, we have a leading entry, and this time the other entry is negative three, meaning it's not zero. So this matrix breaks rule number two. meaning it is not properly row reduced. Let's keep going, let's look at matrix C. All right, maybe pause the video and see if you can determine for the rest of the matrices, do they meet all three criteria or not? If not, then which rule do they violate? All right, so let's take a look at matrix C. This matrix breaks rule number two. I'm not going to walk through each step, so let's go back and make sure you understand why it's breaking rule number two. Matrix D breaks rule number three. And finally, our last matrix, matrix E, is row reduced. Alright, so again, make sure you understand for the last three matrices, why do they meet all of the, the criteria or why do they break any of the criteria? Alright, that's going to be it for section 3.2. I hope to see you back for 3.3.